Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. Okay, well, welcome in, everyone. So this is Lynn Vartan. And for those of you who know us, you know that this is an odd day for us. It's Tuesday, not our normal Thursday. Well, we are so excited to be doing this special Apex Hour on air. For those of you who may be listening for the first time, um, feel free to join us normally on Thursdays at 3 p.m. We also have a podcast that's available, and you can check that out on our SUU website, which is seu.edu slash Apex, to find out more of the show if you like what you're hearing. Well, for those of you who are tuning in today, you are in for such a treat. We have our guest in the studio who is our Apex guest today. A special welcome to John Kerry. We welcome in. Hi, thanks for having me. Yay. Um, This has been such a great day. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about John, then we're going to get into talking. The event today that that, uh, he participated in was generously supported by some other partners that I want to make sure to mention. First and foremost, our Eccles Visiting Scholar Program. So special thanks to to the Eccles Foundation for their support. Um, Of course, Apex Events, our uh, SUU School of Business, and special thank you to our Dean Mary Pearson there. the SEU Entrepreneurship Series, and our Tanner Center. So a lot of guests coming in today. Um, John Carreyrou is an author. We, many of you may know him as an author for his book that has just been skyrocketing in the last uh, year, and the book is titled Bad Blood. But he is, um, his day job, if you will, is a, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Um, so to start out, John, I'd love to talk a little bit about Kind of, uh, if you could tell, for those of us who don't know, what's a day in the life of a journalist for the Wall Street Journal? Ha, it's it's actually not that glamorous. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I live in Brooklyn. Uh, I have three kids. Um, uh, by the time I wake up in the morning around 7 or 7.30, my wife's already uh, long gone. She's a, uh, uh, an editor, rather, at Bloomberg News. Ah. Um, and uh, my kids are 11, 13, and 15, so I'll sometimes overlap with them in the morning as they get ready for school, and then we all go our separate ways. I head in uh, to the journal. Uh, the newsroom is in Midtown Manhattan in the News Corp building, and um, I've got a desk uh, near a window on the fifth floor, which uh, is a desk I've been occupying, I think, for eight years now. Wow. And, uh, you know... A lot of uh, newspaper reporting uh, is conducted over the phone. So, uh, you know, a lot of people may not realize that. Uh, Occasionally, we do also get out of the office and meet sources in person. And and sometimes we... uh, uh, fly to different parts of the country or different parts of the world to to pursue so- stories, but uh, most often uh, we're you know in the newsroom working the phones and talking to sources and writing stories. I don't think I realized it was that much phone interaction. Is, is that a part of the job that you enjoy, or do you have a favorite? Is the writing the part that really turns you on? I love reporting, and and a lot of reporting uh, is over the phone. That's just the the way it is. Um, but uh, some of it uh, is in person. Uh, so you, we may talk about the the story that my book is focused on, which is the whole Theranos scandal, and that involved getting out of the office quite a bit. And um, uh, the bottom line is, reporting is can be a lot of fun. Uh, with each story that you report out, uh, you're often uh, uh, learning new things and and uh, getting a crash course in a new field. I really enjoy that. Uh, I enjoy the challenge of getting information and of getting people to open up and uh, to trust me uh, with that information. Uh, I like uh, breaking uh, stories and, and 
Often they're not positive stories because I'm an investigative reporter. So I tend to be the bearer of bad news, so to speak. Right. Um, but uh, do I do I also love the other part of uh, the job, which is writing? Sure. Um, I, I I would say that I enjoy nonfiction writing even more than newspaper uh, ah. writing, and we can get into the the differences. Uh, but yeah, writing is is a fun part of it as well. Well, I, I'd love to get into the differences. I know I want to talk a little bit about your background, but since since you mentioned it, I'd love to know a little bit about the differences. Bad Blood is your first uh, nonfiction book, is that That's right? right. Mm -hmm. And what are how is the how is the writing different? It's very different because when you work for a newspaper, especially for the Wall Street Journal, which is uh, a newspaper uh, well known for how rigorous it is and and vetting. Uh, information and making sure that the information it publishes is accurate. Uh, you're writing and uh, attrib attributing almost every sentence that you write either to an on-the-record source by name or uh, to a study or to a statement that someone put out or sometimes to an anonymous source or to a document. And uh, so virtually, if you, if you read a, a Wall Street Journal story, virtually every sentence will be attributed to something or someone and um, you can't do that uh, when you're writing a, a nonfiction book if you're hoping to hook the reader and and really uh, you know grab him and and have him uh, him or her turn the pages. Uh, the reading has got to the, the writing has got to be smoother, right? Um, and uh, in some ways, it's got to read more like fiction. It's got to be engaging, and so it doesn't mean you sacrifice any part of the the rigor that goes into the reporting. The reporting stays the same, but instead of attributing every sentence, you uh, will do footnotes and endnotes. And so if you look at my book, Bad Blood, I think there's like 30 pages of endnotes right. at the end of the book. Um, and you can refer to them and you can see that, um, you know, I provide uh, attribution in that manner and, I, and sourcing in that manner. It just doesn't interrupt the narrative in the way that it does when you're reading a newspaper article. Right. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that explanation. Going into your background a little bit, um, I know from from reading about you that you spent you have you grew up in France and spent time living in France, Brussels. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you came to be a journalist? How you came to where you are now? Sure. So uh, my father is French, my mother is American, and I did grow up living in France in Paris. Um, and I effectively uh, marinated in journalism from a young age because my father was a broadcast journalist. Uh, his specialty was politics, mainly domestic politics. And he was a, a radio uh, journalist for seventeen first seventeen years of his career, and then and then he was a network TV journalist for the last half of his career. He, in fact, he remains a journalist today. And um, I grew up really uh, in that environment. And uh, when uh, I went to college, I, I finished high school in France and went to college here in the U.S. at Duke uh, University in North Carolina. Uh, I wanted to give other things a chance. Um, I knew that journalism was probably uh, always going to be an option, and so I wanted to, you know, tr keep an open mind and try other things. And so, for that reason, I never worked for the the Duke paper, the Duke Chronicle. Um, it, I guess another factor probably played into it too, which is that I was insecure about my writing in English, huh. and so I wanted, um, you know, to improve my writing before I tried to to do any writing for the newspaper. And I never ended up working for the Chronicle. And then when I got to uh, the end of my four years and I graduated, I, I thought long and hard about what I wanted to do. And I decided that by then I'd improved as a writer uh, a lot and I loved writing. And I thought it it was something that was going to involve writing. And um, I also uh, read All the President's Men, the, the mm -hmm. book by Woodward and, and Wernstein, sorry, Woodward and Bernstein about Watergate and how they uncovered Watergate. Uh, which was really inspiring. And I thought to myself, well, um, why don't I marry, you know, my love of writing with reporting and journalism and uh, which would mean either going to work for a newspaper or a magazine. And so I, that's when I started applying to, to jobs in the newspaper industry. Oh, cool. And uh, to lead into getting into the book and getting into this amazing story, 
you know, crazy, amazing story about Theranos. Um, you, in some ways, were the perfect journalist to uncover this because you have some background, a lot of background in, in medical writing, medical journal m- reporting. Can you talk a little bit about that part of your, uh, of your time and, and, and some of those projects? Sure. So I started my career uh, at Dow Jones Newswires back in 1995. That's the sister wire service of the Wall Street Journal. And after two years in New York, they sent me to Paris knowing I was bilingual. And uh, and then the journal hired me uh, for a job in its Brussels bureau. So I moved from Paris to Brussels. And then the journal eventually sent me back to, to Paris. And I spent another five years working for the, the journal in Paris. And so the first, uh, you know, s- six to uh, eight years of my journal career were abroad in Europe. And I only came back to the mothership, the, the newsroom in New York, in uh, 2006, early 2006. And at that point, I had to specialize. When you're a foreign correspondent, you get to roam a lot and tackle different subjects. And and you, you kind of, um, you know, uh, it's whatever's it, both in the news at the moment or the topics that you pick, but you have a lot of freedom to roam. Um, when you're working from uh, the newsroom in New York with the hundreds of other journalists who make up the newsroom, uh, you find out that you have to specialize because the beats are narrower. Um, And so I had to specialize, and I made the decision to specialize in medical and healthcare reporting. Uh, The journal had a long tradition of fantastic healthcare and medical and science reporting. And I knew that, and so um, I wanted to join that tradition and be part of it. So when I came back to New York, I joined our healthcare and, and medicine desk and uh, gravita- gravitated increasingly toward investigative reporting about the U.S. healthcare system, and eventually was, you know, doing uh, so much of it that it made sense for me to transition to the investigative group, where I continued to mainly focus on that uh, topic. And so, by the time I got a, a tip regarding Theranos in early 2015. I had a decade of uh, medical and healthcare reporting under my belt, mm-hmm. and so I was pretty well equipped to to take that story on. Yeah, one of the questions that came up uh, in one of the discussions today was, uh, and and we'll get into some more specifics, but that aspect of it, how um, there had been news articles about uh, Elizabeth and the people involved, and magazine articles, uh, and some people have asked the question, you know, why uh, did those uh, agencies or organizations not see what you saw? And it seems to me that your background was perfectly suited. Right. And and I think um, uh, that the reporters who uh, helped Elizabeth Holmes raise her profile during 2013, 2014, and to 2015, and who, um, you know, uh, wrote about her and, and took all her claims at face value, uh, didn't have this background. Um, Roger Parloff, uh, who put her on the co- cover of Fortune magazine in June 2014, was a legal correspondent. I don't think he'd ever written about uh, healthcare or medicine. Uh, Ken Oletta, who wrote a long profile of her in The New Yorker in late 2014, uh, has written many books and uh, does a lot of uh, writing about Silicon Valley and about disruption and about technology, but not necessarily about medicine or healthcare. And so you, you had... Um, these half dozen journalists who spent time with her, uh, but who didn't really have uh, the the background and the expertise to question what she was telling them. Um, and I think that was a, a big advantage that I had when I came along in early 2015. Great. Well, it's time for a musical break. And then when we come back, we will definitely get into the specifics of of, of the story and of your book, Bad Blood. So John Carreyrou is in the studio with me. You're listening to the Apex Hour on KSU Thunder 91.1. I have a couple of songs to play for you today. Um, I think I've mentioned that I, I've got a couple new bands sent my way, or new to me at least. And the first song that you're going to hear is from a band called L.A. Witch, and the song is Baby in Blue Jeans. So thanks for listening to the Apex Hour.
All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. This is Lynn Vartan, and you are listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. I'm thrilled to be joined in the studio today with John Kerry Rue. Welcome back, John. Thanks for having me. That song that you were listening to is called Baby in Blue Jeans, and the band is called L.A. Witch. Um, and special shout out to Sylvia, my dear friend, who's been recommending a couple of great bands and throwing them my way. So thanks, Sylvia. Um, so John Carreyrou is the author of Bad Blood, and many people know the story. But if, if you don't mind just giving us a little bit of an outline in case anybody is new to the party. Sure. So the Bad Blood is the story of Theranos and its founder, Elizabeth Holmes. Um, Elizabeth was a uh, sophomore at Stanford University back in 2003 when she decided to drop out of school and uh, launch a, a startup uh, in the heart of Silicon Valley that she called Theranos. Uh, that was a, a combination of, of the words therapy and diagnosis. And uh, she had a vision for her startup, which is that it would create a medical device, a blood testing device um, that would be portable and that would be able to uh, test for hundreds of uh, different analytes from a tiny sample of blood pricked from the finger. And she went about raising money and hired people, and um, they built several iterations of, of the technology. And... Um, Unfortunately, uh, they encountered setbacks because medical science is hard and uh, they didn't really ever fulfill her vision that they, they had uh, prototypes that didn't work. And yet she nonetheless uh, went live with these fake uh, and faulty blood tests in Walgreens stores in California and Arizona in late 2013. And as she launched commercially this uh, pseudo technology, she raised her profile and she became well known in Silicon Valley and beyond, and and her company reached a valuation of ten billion dollars, and she had half the stock, so she was effectively worth five billion dollars. She was the youngest self-made uh, female billionaire on the planet, and uh, and then I came along uh, <laughs> in early 2015, and I exposed her lies um, first with a uh, an investigation investigative article in in the Wall Street Journal in late 2015, and. Um, that uh, eventually was corroborated by regulatory actions and uh, led to all sorts of fallout. And I followed that up with a book, Bad Blood, that I published last May. And three weeks after my book was published, Elizabeth Holmes and her ex-boyfriend, who had been the number two executive at the company, were indicted on uh, criminal fraud charges. And they are now awaiting trial, facing uh, prison terms of as many as 20 years. And I know a lot of people have asked where where the different trials are right now. The civil case was settled. The Elizabeth Holmes settled uh, her side of the civil case with the Securities and Exchange Commission. She agreed to surrender most of her stock in Theranos, which, by the way, has since been dissolved. It's no longer a going concern. Uh, she also agreed to pay a half million dollars uh, as a, a penalty, and she agreed to be banned from being a director or officer in a public company for 10 years. Um, but Sonny, her uh, alleged co-conspirator, uh, is still fighting the SEC's civil case. Oh. So whereas Elizabeth has settled the SEC's civil case, he's still fighting it. So he's still fighting on two fronts. He's fighting the civil case against the SEC, and he's fighting the criminal case against the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco. And the criminal case, we don't have dates yet that's still in the works, as no, I understand. The, the next status conference is in April, and uh, the hope is that the judge sets a trial date at that status conference. I, I doubt that the trial would start before the very end of this year, and more likely uh, it, it will start sometime next year. And I think one of the things that that brings to light is the, I mean, it has consumed your life for a great four number of years. Four years now. Four right? years. And then to look at the scope of the story, uh, the beginnings are 2006 or maybe even earlier. So she dropped out in late 2003. She incorporated uh, Theranos as a company in 2004. Um, and then I exposed her in 2015. So the company was going for a dozen years before she was exposed. And then the fallout leads into 2020, probably most right, likely. Right, you know? right. Yeah, I know there's a long arc to this story. 
And that's that's one of the things about it that is, I mean, there are, I think the thing that I've been um, just realizing again and again over the course of your visit here is the the scope of it and and the time is just one of those things. I've been now watching. You've been so generous to speak with classes and and have different meals and things. And one of the things that's been so amazing is how everyone is just transfixed about learning more about this. And um, did that aspect of it surprise you kind of the, the, the way the, the world, uh, especially the United States, but the world kind of grabbed onto this with all the different facets? Yeah, not so much because uh, it was uh, when I fell upon it and then uh, reported it out and learned all the facts, I thought, that it was a crazy story myself, um, with with you know various subplots, uh, including a you know a family feud between a famous grandfather and his grandson, and um, uh, egregious fraud. The not just uh, investors uh, being lied to, but all, also patients and doctors being misled, and the, the public health being jeopardized, um, and um, you know attempts to. Uh, intimidate me and, and my newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, when we uh, were uh, going to report the story, as well as uh, you know uh, my sources being put under surveillance and and threatened, and um, one of arguably uh, most famous uh, and most aggressive lawyers in America was involved in this story on behalf of Theranos, David Boyes. So um, I realized early on that this had all the ingredients to to, to be a story and a book that that fascinated a lot of people and that had a lot of crossover appeal. I'm not, so I'm not entirely surprised, uh, that, um, you know, uh, that people can't seem to get enough of this story. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I mean, the names involved alone. I mean, you, when you talk about Henry Kissinger and the Schultz family and Joe Biden and even Rupert Murdoch, I mean, it just, it, it just seems stranger than fiction in a way, which is fascinating. One of the things that, that people ask a lot about is, um, is about Elizabeth. And, and we were having a conversation about, uh, uh, in one of the classes earlier about ethics and about that, that line. And it seems to me that you, you see a, a sort of a clear line where things, I mean, things were going wrong from the beginning, but a clear line where, a, a clear moment where that line was crossed. A point of no return. Exactly. Um, and and so I'll preface that by saying that, uh, in my view, Elizabeth Holmes was not a Bernie Madoff who uh, one day when she dropped out of Stanford decided to go rogue and to say, I'm going to, I'm going to do a long con and I'm going to premeditate this con and I'm going to defraud investors and put patients in harm's way. I don't believe that's what happened. I believe she dropped out of Stanford in 2003 with the best intentions. She wanted to, she was ambitious and driven. And she had this idea that she also would be good for society that would uh, help improve blood testing and make it more user friendly, potentially even lead to, uh, you know, saved lives. Um, I think it's a story where, you know, as she went along, she lost her way. Um, she uh, began to cut corners. She began to tell small lies that became big lies. She never acknowledged the scientific setbacks that she and her teams encountered along the way. And she pretended that everything was hunky dory to the board and to investors. And she reached this point of no return in uh, the fall of 2013 when she decides to, to go live with the technology in Walgreens stores and to commercialize it first in two uh, Walgreens stores in Northern California and then in another 40 or so in the Phoenix area. And, um, and that's where this this morphs uh, into a massive fraud because it's no longer just investors being lied to; it's also patients, uh, uh, their lives being you know toyed with essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I think most people who have either read the book or are familiar with my journal reporting and you know have come to learn all the facts of this story. I think most nine out of ten, maybe ninety nine out of a hundred people. Are are outraged by this that that she was so cavalier about um, patients' lives and that they were just uh, you know pawns to her in in her quest to become the next Steve Jobs and to join the this pantheon of uh, uh, successful Silicon Valley you know billionaires. 
Well, that's one of the things you mentioned in your talk today that that really hit home for me. Uh, there is this um, myth or or the concept of the myth or the mythical icon in in Silicon Valley. So, and and she looked up to these um, to the Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, all of these people, and and with software, there is a tradition of, as you said, a fake it till you make it right. kind of thing. But the, there's a big difference here with the medical part. Right. And she idol, she absolutely idolized Jobs. I mean, she, to the point that she started dressing like him uh, in the early years of the company. And really up until recently, she was always wearing a black turtleneck. She wanted her, her uh, various blood testing machines to look like uh, a Mac or an iPhone. She was constantly invoking uh, Jobs and Apple uh, another uh, role model was Larry Ellison, who was actually an early investor in Theranos. And, uh, you know, talking about uh, faking it until you make it, uh, Larry Ellison was arguably the biggest practitioner of that. He, uh, in the early years of Oracle, Oracle, uh, they would ship, uh, you know, database software that was crawling with bugs uh, to the point that uh, early clients of Oracle uh, would call uh, Oracle's programmers and work with them to debug the software after they'd already paid for it. That's crazy. Um, and meanwhile, Ellison would be, you know, trumpeting these new features that his programmers hadn't even begun working on. Mm -hmm. So he he was a big uh, practitioner of fake it till you make it. And in Elizabeth's eyes, you know, he got away with it. Um, now he's one of the richest co people in the world, and uh, Oracle is one of the most respected, you know, Fortune 100 companies. And, um, you know, she thought if a guy like Larry Ellison, if Steve Jobs, her hero, if Bill Gates, if all these people were able to get away with faking it until they made, made it uh, early in their careers, then why wasn't she entitled to do the same thing and to behave the same way? And the answer is, well, there's a big difference. You know, those guys were from the computer world and their products were hardware, computer hardware and software. And you can put out uh, a software product product that's buggy. Uh, or a smartphone app even that's buggy and it's not going to affect uh, life. Um, with medicine, if you're putting out a uh, blood testing device that doesn't work and uh, you're leading uh, uh, doctors and patients to rely on it for important health decisions, then you are putting lives in, in jeopardy. The stakes are much, much higher in medicine and the Silicon Valley playbook is ill-suited to medicine. Unfortunately, she either didn't realize that or she knew it on some level but preferred to ignore it as she you know pursued her quest and so many of the tests already have been voided and i know there's a recommendation that every test right theranos voided about a million blood tests uh after my uh, reporting uh exposed the company and i know for a fact that the last laboratory director at the company who was hired to try to clean up the operation uh, recommended to Elizabeth Holmes that she void many more millions of blood tests because the, the quality control inside the laboratory was so non-existent that he felt they, they couldn't vouch for really any of the tests that Theranos had put out. But Elizabeth didn't listen to it, so they stopped the voiding at about one million. But th this gives you a scale of the, you know, the, the public health catastrophe that this thing could have been. Yeah. Well, thank you for for that outline and, and stories about the book. Um, it's time for another musical break. When we come back, I'd love to um, maybe talk about some of the other people who are involved and, and kind of how maybe how they're doing now and, and some of the pushback that you've experienced. I know people are very curious about that as well. Uh, in the meantime, let's listen to another song. This song is called a zero zero B zero one interesting title. And the artist is Juana Molina and this is KSU Thunder 91.1.
All right. Well, welcome back. That's kind of an odd, unusual song, but I'm kind of into this band right now. That That is Juana Molina, and that song is A00B01. Um, this is Lynn Vartan. You're listening to the Apex Hour, and I'd like to welcome back in my guest for today, John Kerry. Welcome back. Hello again. We've been talking about your book, Bad Blood, which is um, exposes uh, the Theranos scandal and, and tells everything about it. And one of the things that I think people are really um, drawn to is, is all of the, the people who had the courage to come and speak to you and talk to you and, and give you the fuel for this story. Um, we've, we've spent a little bit of time talking about um, Tyler and, and Erica and some of the other people, and I wondered if you could give us a little bit of a, an update on, on how things are going for, for the ones that you can tell us about. Sure. So um, I, I guess my first and uh, most important source was the laboratory director who, uh, at the time I made contact with him in early 2015, had just left Theranos. And uh, I'm still protecting his identity to this day, so I can't say much about him. Um, uh, he goes by a pseudonym in the book, Alan Beam, and uh, he's probably the story's biggest hero. Um, uh, two other heroes and and who are corroborating sources are Tyler Schultz, the grandson of our former Secretary of State, George Schultz, who was a Theranos board member, and um, and his friend, who who uh, was also a Theranos employee, uh, Erica Chung. And uh, they spent uh, about eight months each working at the company in, in uh, 2013 and 2014 and uh, left uh, after uh, trying to um, – alert Tyler's grandfather uh, to their misgivings about what was going on. And I eventually made contact with them and they became uh, sources for me. And, you know, they, uh, uh, Tyler especially had to uh, withstand tremendous pressure because Theranos and its lawyers figured out that he was one of my sources. And so they did things like ambush him uh, in uh, the house of his grandfather on the Stanford campus. And threatened him with litigation, tried to uh, get him to uh, admit that he was a source of mine and to retract what he had told me and to name my other sources. And um, he, uh, you know, had to deal with this, these threats and, and this intimidation campaign for months until I published my first story. Uh, he had to hire lawyers. Uh, his parents spent almost a half million dollars uh, on legal fees defending him. Um, in the end, uh, he uh, stood firm. He never signed any of the pieces of paper that, that Theranos put to him. He never recanted. Uh, he's a real hero here. And so is Erica, by the way. And, and uh, Theranos tried to threaten Erica, too. Um, ambushed her in the parking lot late one Friday wow. of her new employer, um, you know, with an envelope containing a, a threatening letter from David Boys. And even more than the contents of, let of the letter itself, what freaked her out the most were the uh, the words on the envelope, the, the address on the envelope was the address of a, of a colleague of hers whose house she'd only been staying at for two weeks. Wow. And no one knew other than the colleague, not even her mother, that she, she was living there. And so um, Erica became terrified because she understood that she was under surveillance. Um, these are the types of uh, tactics that this company and its lawyers engaged in. Uh, I mean, we're talking about thuggish tactics. Mm -hmm. Uh, used against young people, you know, Tyler and Erica were 24, 25 years old at the at the time of these events, and all they did was uh, try to do the right thing, and and uh, that's how the company repaid them. Um, in terms of you know where they are now, they're they're doing good. Um, Tyler uh, has started his own company, and uh, uh -huh. it's funded, and he's got a couple employees. It's based in San Francisco, and it's trying to uh, create diagnostic technology of its own. Um, mm -hmm. His grandfather, for a long time, uh, was estranged from him and sided with Elizabeth Holmes over Thanks. his own grandson, which was one of the, the tragedies of this story. But fortunately, in recent months, uh, George has come around and seen the light and apologized to Tyler and called Tyler a hero in front of the entire Schultz family. Wow. Um, so that's been, that's been great, a great vindication for Tyler and nice also that uh, he's mending the fences with his grandfather. And Erica is currently living in Hong Kong, and uh, she's the head of a, an incubator there, mm -hmm. a, a startup incubator, and she's doing great as well. I saw both of them uh, about a month ago. 
at the Sundance Film Festival, um, where I was to uh, attend the premiere of the Theranos documentary that will air soon on HBO. It's called The Inventor, and the director is Alex Gibney. Okay, great. So we can be on the lookout for that uh, to March see March 18th. More. March 18th, HBO. Okay, The Inventor. Well, that is uh, really in, uh, heartening to hear how Tyler's story has turned around a bit because it's it's really heartbreaking uh, to to read in in the book and um it's re- a really interesting statement on on these these young people in these companies who really had had the ethics to stand firm. Right. Yeah, I mean they were they were young but they were well educated. Uh Tyler had graduated from Stanford and and Erica had graduated from Berkeley and they were both uh biology majors. And, um, even though they, they hadn't gone to med school and they weren't PhDs, they had enough, uh, science training to know that some of the, uh, behaviors that they witnessed, uh, during their stints at Theranos were not right. Um, that, uh, cherry picking data when you're running scientific experiments, uh, they knew that that's not how real science works. You don't conveniently get rid of data points that, uh, you know, uh, don't confirm your hypothesis. Um, and, uh, and they also, you know, at the time consulted with colleagues of, uh, theirs who were older and more experienced who confirmed their misgivings. And so, uh, in the end, they, they, uh, they went by their own personal moral compasses and they, they acted, uh, in they way and the thing in the way, I'm sorry, that they felt was the right way to, to act. Mm-hmm. And initially, um, you know, the, the company retaliated against them. But uh, now uh, it's been about three years since my first story was published. Uh, they're actually, you know, they've been vindicated and they're both doing well. I know they were recently at Stanford on the Stanford campus invited to talk about their experiences as whistleblowers. And, uh, you know, they, they got a, a big ovation there in one of the auditoriums on the Stanford campus. So um, everything has turned out well for them. That's fantastic. Very inspiring. And you had to weather quite the storm as well. As I understand, it was a, a significant amount of pushback, perhaps the most you've seen. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, in 20 years of reporting, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, uh, you know, we we uh, had to deal with David Boys, arguably, you know, the most fearsome litigator in America who came uh, to our offices not once but twice to, to threaten us and, and try to intimidate us. Uh, uh, we, we received multiple letters from him uh, making clear that, that uh, Theranos was going to sue us for defamation if we uh, continued down the road we were headed. Um, uh, Erica, Tyler, and Alan Beam, the ex-lab director, were all put under surveillance um, the company hired private investigators to surveil them. Tyler's parents were even under surveillance. Mm. Um, uh, Sonny Balwani, Elizabeth Holmes's uh, boyfriend, and the ex number two executive at the company, flew to Phoenix and uh, threatened in person the doctors who had uh, cooperated with my story on the record and who had uh, put me in touch with patients who'd gotten uh, discordant blood test results. Sonny actually threatened these doctors and tried to get them to sign prepared statements recanting what they had told me. Um, I had never encountered anything uh, like this in 20 years of reporting. It was really surreal. Wow. I felt like I was in a Hollywood movie. Yeah. Well, and I know people have been asking you, uh, speaking of movies, are there plans? And uh, we've been talking a little bit, but is there anything you can share with our audience about a, a future movie? Right. So there are plans for a Hollywood movie. Uh, my book, Bad Blood, has been optioned by the studio Legendary Entertainment. And uh, Adam McKay, uh, the director of The Big Short and Vice, is attached to produce and to direct the movie. And Jennifer Lawrence is attached to star as Elizabeth Holmes. And uh, Vanessa Taylor, who co-wrote uh, The Shape of Water, is currently hard at work on the screenplay. Um, and I'm told the screenplay should be ready within, uh, the next three weeks. Wow. And so, uh, hopefully, you know, may- maybe the shooting starts, uh, sometime, uh, this, this year or next. Uh, but, uh, there are certainly, uh, plans afoot for a movie. 
Fantastic. We can't wait. But in the meantime, if you have not already picked up a copy and read Bad Blood by John Kerry Ryu, please do so. I promise you will not want to put it down. It is just... Uh, just such a fascinating story told in in such a skillful way. Um, and then, as we mentioned, there will be a documentary coming out on HBO March, in March called The Inventor. So, And then after that, the movie. Well, we are almost out of time today. Um, but, John, I have a question that I always ask my guests, which is a little bit of a playful one. And it's, uh, what is turning you on this week? And, of course, it could be anything. It's just a little personal uh, tidbit for our audience members who listen. And it could be it could be a TV show, a movie, a book, a podcast, a song, a band, whatever whatever you like. So, John Kerry, what's turning you on this week? R- right. So, as I mentioned earlier um, in the interview, I'm uh, half French. My father's French, and I grew up in Paris. And so I'm a big uh, supporter of the French national team, the soccer team. Uh, and I'm also a, a rabid fan of Paris Saint-Germain, the, the Paris's uh, uh, soccer club. Uh, and by the way, Neymar, uh, you may have heard of him, plays for PSG. Yeah. <laughs> and they're playing Manchester United uh, tomorrow in the second leg of their Champions League uh, match. And uh, PSG won in Manchester a couple weeks ago 2 nothing. Oh, that's... So, so they're in good position to advance, but you never know, and I'll be keeping a close eye on tomorrow's game. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, thank you so much, John, for spending the time in the studio today and for sharing about your book, Bad Blood. Everybody check it out for sure. Um, That's all the time we have today. So I'm going to sign off here and uh, we will be off next week for spring break, but we will see you later. Um, Bye for today from the Apex Hour. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.